connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Doug Maynard, your host for the next hour, and Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to curate and convene and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Uh, and since we are live, I want to remind everyone that you do have the opportunity to type questions into the question box at any time during the session. Uh, we may check for questions at any point, so don't uh, feel you need to wait until we ask for questions. Just type them in as you think of them. Even if you think we might answer it later in the session, just go ahead and type that in. And if you do want to sh also uh, share your thoughts on Twitter, be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. And before we start, I just wanted to make uh, an announcement. Uh, many of you may uh, hopefully are aware we've uh, uh, had the, the, the opportunity to launch a new knowledge mobilization network along with our colleagues at uh, Dalhousie University. Dr. Christine Chambers and I are co-leading uh, a Networks of Centers of Excellence knowledge mobilization network that was just officially launched uh, last week in Halifax. We had a very successful launch with our partners at uh, Volta Effect, which is a, an innovation incubator in Halifax. And we just recently, just yesterday, uh, had a, a, a public lecture hosted by uh, Andre Picard and our colleagues at the Ontario Brain Institute. Yesterday was our second launch event at our second uh, hub city. Uh, we do have another event coming up in Ottawa and also one uh, coming up at our hub in Edmonton in May. Uh, so, you know, keep an eye out for uh, any um, updates around that. And if you do want to make sure you do see the latest information, you can see the uh, website kidsinpain.ca on the screen. And there's an opportunity to keep me in the loop button, you can sign up for the email newsletter and uh, get uh, all the updates of uh, Skip's activities as we, as I said, we just launched. So we're just uh, slowly getting into the activities phase in the next uh, few months or so. So if you want to make sure you're part of that, make sure you sign up for the email newsletter there. All right. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, it's time to uh, get into the presentation. So today we're going to be talking about mental health of immigrant and refugee children and youth in Canada, pathways to care and health system utilization. Mental health, certainly one of Children's Healthcare Canada's uh, priorities as part of our current strategic plan. And the interesting angle we're going to see presented here today that I think will be of particular use to our audience, uh, as uh, we have an, a substantial portion of our audience being administrators responsible for establishing and coordinating services. Uh, we're going to see, get some insight into patterns of usage uh, for this particularly vulnerable population, which I think will be uh, uh, particularly useful uh, to this audience of, of program ad ad administrators uh, in the mental health uh, sector across our community. So uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to in introduce Dr. Natasha Sanders. Uh, Dr. Saunders is a uh, cl clinician, investigator, and pediatrician in the Division of Pediatric Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And she's also a an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. And, sh and she's an adjunct scientist at uh, ISIS, which is the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Studies, sciences, I may have got that acronym wrong, um, but uh, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Saunders. Great, thanks. Um, so thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to um, be able to present on a body of work that we've been doing at what is now called ICES, uh, previously the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. Um, so this is work on uh, that we've been doing on the mental health of immigrant and refugee children and youth um, and looking both at their pathways to care and, and health system utilization in this population. I have no uh, financial relationships or conflicts of interest. Um, so, as many of you know, mental health problems are very common among youth and contribute to significant morbidity and mortality across the globe, and they affect about 20% of the population. 
most major mental illnesses begin in adolescence and young adulthood. And um, recent data suggest mental health service use is increasing across North America. So we're seeing it um, and, and certainly feeling it um, on our wards in the emergency rooms and in our outpatient clinics. Um, in the US, around 3% of all pediatric emergency department visits are for mental illness and 10% of hospital admissions are mental health related. Um, and in Canada, we don't have um, the best data on that, but, but it, the numbers are similar. And understanding trends over time in utilization of mental health services is critical for optimal health service delivery. And accordingly, to make appropriately targeted health system improvements, identifying mental health trends in at-risk populations, including the growing population of immigrant children and youth is important. Um, there are currently challenges in ensuring access to high quality care. Um, and this is increasingly being recognized in this population. Immigrants specifically may face challenges integrating pre and post migration exposures in their new lot with their new lives in a host country. Um, and these experiences can influence the complex set of factors that can shape an immigrant's ability to access health services and their risk for mental health problems, both uh, before, upon and after arrival. So um, in Canada, approximately 21.9% of the population is a landed immigrant or a permanent resident, and that is they've been granted permission to live and work in Canada without limitations on their stay. And about half of these immigrants migrate to Ontario. Of these, around 80 to 85 percent are economic or family class arriving as non-refugees. Economic class immigrants um, and their families are selected to come to Canada based on their skills and ability to contribute to Canada's economy, including skilled workers, business immigrants, provincial and territorial nominees and live-in caregivers. And family class immigrants are people sponsored to come to or remain in Canada by a relative who is either a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. And over the last two decades, there have been major shifts in immigration patterns to Canada. In particular, in recent years, there's been a relative increase in, in migration from South and East Asian populations, with a simultaneous decline in immigrants from Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And these shifts are indicative of changing drivers of global migration, including political instability, economic opportunity, and family reunification. Um, and accompanying this variation in migration may include changes to mental health burden and service use. Um, so existing literature on the epidemiology of mental health problems in immigrant children and youth is, is quite inconsistent and typically based on smaller subsets of immigrants, most of which rely on self-report. And social deprivation, which is common among immigrants, is often cited as a risk factor for mental health problems. But there may actually be protective immigration factors that counter this risk. Some adult studies suggest there's a healthy immigrant effect, and that is individuals arrive in better health with lower rates of mental health problems than native-born counterparts. And this may be due to differences in immigration policies in receiving countries that select for physically and mentally healthier individuals. Um, but we know little about mental health service use in Canadian immigrants and how that has changed over time at a population level. So I want to present to you today uh, three papers that we have um, published recently um, looking at health system utilization, suicide and self-harm, um, as well as pathways to um, care in immigrant youth. The first paper um, we, we published was on trends in mental health service utilization in immigrant youth. And we um, wanted to basically describe the trends in mental health service utilization um, in Ontario uh, in children and immigrant children and youth who are immigrants compared with long-term residents or essentially Canadian born. Um, and then we wanted to compare them by subgroups of immigrants, so by their immigration class and how long they've been in Canada and their region of origin. Um, so all of these studies are population-based studies using linked health and demographic data sets that we have available at ICES. Um, so what essentially happens is we have a number of databases looking at uh, um, of immigrants using the health system um, and non-immigrants using the health system based on their health insurance card um, or health insurance number. And that includes things like hospital records, emergency records, um, outpatient visits, um, mental health beds. And we, we link all of these, um, and it's linked to the Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada's Permanent Re Resident Database. Um, and so we can identify who is an immigrant and, and who is not and where they come from and how long they've been here. For this particular study and, and the next one, we looked at youth ages 10 to 24 years living in Ontario, and we used three-year cohorts from 1996 to 2012. 
For our immigration data, um, we have individual level demographic information on immigrants who arrived in Ontario between 1985 to 2017. When we did this study, we only had up to 2012. Um, uh, but uh, now we're able to look a little bit further going forward. Um, some of the available immigra immigration characteristics we have are their visa class. So, for example, refugees and non-refugees. And we can we can look more. Um, uh, we can get down to the nitty gritty in terms of what type of refugee they came as or what type of economic class uh, immigrant they came as. But uh, for now, we're just um, grouping them into larger categories. We can look at how long they have been in Canada what their region of origin is and what their country of origin is. Some limitations to the data we have available, which are quite important, especially in the mental health sphere, is that we, we don't have visits to social workers or psychologists or other non-physician mental health service providers, um, as these are not covered by OHIP, the Ontario Health Insurance Plan. And so we are not able to identify uh, visits to those providers, which certainly um, is, is likely a, a substantial proportion of mental health service providers. Um, we also don't have data from asylum seekers, so those arriving in Canada and sub subsequently seeking refugee status who have not yet received permanent residency status, and, and they are not captured in this particular database. So for this study, the main exposure, the main group comparisons we were looking at were um, whether or not people were in a recent immigrant, so less than 10 years in Canada, or whether or not they were a long-term resident of Canada, so um, essentially Canadian-born or have been here for a while. Um, and again, we looked at their immigration class, how long they've been here, and their region of origin. The main outcome measures that we were looking at were any mental health outpatient visits, mental health emergency department visits, and mental health hospitalizations. And for those who are statisticians or epidemiologists on the line, we um, use linear time trends for each outcome uh, by immigration status, and we use multi-variable multi Poisson regression models, um, adjusting for things like their age, their, in, their neighborhood level income, sex, and community size. So in our cohorts for each three year period, we had about two and a half to three million person years in each cohort period. So these are huge numbers. Um, around 88 to 90 percent were long term residents, depending on which cohort year it was. And about 10 percent were recent immigrants. Um, of the immigrants, 82 percent were non refugees and around 18 percent were refugee immigrants. So. This uh, next uh, slide shows the rates of health service use over time. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you can see in the blue line, these represent the, the immigrant uh, groups, the recent immigrants, and the purple or pink line represents the long-term residents. Um, on this side, we have um, hospital admissions or hospitalizations. And what you can uh, see at first is that the rates of hospitalizations are much lower in recent immigrants compared with um, long-term residents in Canada. What you can see here is there's this very steep incline um, in the rates of hospitalization for mental health problems um, in both groups, but really quite steep in this uh, long-term resident group. When we look at this middle panel, what we see over time, again, that immigrants have much lower rates of emergency department visits for mental health, um, but that the rates are increasing over time and in both groups and at a steeper rate in the, um, in the uh, non-immigrant group or long-term resident group. When we look at this right-handed panel, um, a right-sided panel, we see that immigrants, again, have lower rates of outpatient visits for mental health, but the rates are declining over time. Um, so in contrast to the acute care services, so emergency departments and admissions, the outpatient visits are declining, whereas in immigrants, the rates are, uh, are increasing. When we look across um, the groups by refugees who have been here uh, for zero to five years, sorry, non-refugees who have been here for zero to five years um, or five to 10 years or refugees who have been here zero to five versus five to 10 years, we see similar um, trends in these subgroups. So what we see is, um, Sorry, my screen is just frozen. What we see is that hospitalizations have increased in most of the groups. Um, emergency departments have also increased in most of the groups and inpatient, sorry, outpatient visits have de declined across all of the groups. Um, so we're seeing this fairly universally um, amongst immigrants. <laughs> 
Um, this next slide shows um, what's happening across the globe. So what we've done here is we've looked at um, the, the green is outpatient visits, the red is emergency department visits, and the, the uh, blue is hospitalizations based on the region of origin. And down in the bottom right corner here, we have um, long-term residents. So this is our reference population where you know the rates of outpatient visits are going up. But what you can see across all of these is that the green line or the outpatient visits, no matter where you come from, is declining over time, except in European and Central Asian immigrants. Um, and the rates of um, emergency department visits and hospitalizations are increasing um, in immigrants from across the globe, um, no matter where you come from. So this is something we are seeing essentially universally um, across all immigrant groups. So our main finding then is that mental health service use um, is consistently lower in immigrants. Um, and this may be related to the healthy immigrant effect. So what we have described uh, has been well described in the adult population, but less well in, in the child and youth population. Um, it may also be that there is greater stigma in, in among immigrants where they're not seeking um, mental health care as much as um, immigrant, uh, non-immigrant children. Um, the other main finding is that the rates of acute care and mental health service use are increased over time in both populations, but at a faster rate in long-term residents. And again, this may be that we're reducing stigma overall, which is great, um, but we're not reducing it as well in immigrant populations. Um, it also may mean that there's improved access to acute care services, and so that's where people are going to get their care. Our other main finding is that outpatient mental health service use increased over time in long-term residents, but declined in recent immigrants. And it may be that there are emerging inequities in service delivery for recent immigrants. It may be that there is a lack of famili familiarity with mental health service availability and understanding where to get help for immigrants. It may also be that there are differences in informal supports or social networks for immigrants. So, for example, if an immigrant comes and, and lands in Ontario and um, uses more faith-based services um, as opposed to traditional um, physician-based mental health services, um, we're, that maybe is what it, we're picking up in these data. And then finally, similar trends were observed uh, across both refugees and non-refugee immigrants and from the majority of world regions. Um, but there was this component where we saw that immigrants from East Asia and Central Asia, sorry, Eastern Europe and Central Asia um, had rates more similar to long-term residents of Canada. And it may be that there are cultural similarities or health system similarities that immigrants from those regions are more familiar with and, and know how to navigate the healthcare system uh, because of the familiarity they have in their home country. So the implications of this is that we're seeing an increasing disparity in outpatient and acute care service use over time, and we need to explore why this service gap exists and need to develop policies to reduce potential inequality, inequities in access um, with an active effort to clarify the role of mental health services for recent immigrants. The next study we um, did, uh, also published in BMJ Open, used the same cohort of children and youth, but this time we were wanted to describe time trends in rates of suicide and self-harm in recent immigrant children and youth compared with long-term residents, and again looking at this by immigrant class, duration of residence, and region of origin. Again, it was the same study design looking using a population-based longitudinal study using these linked data sets and again, linking all these um, health and demographic data sets to um, the Immigration and Refugees and Citizenship Canada permanent resident data system. And, and we're very lucky to have um, this linkage available to help um, inform some of the health system use of this uh, very important population. Again, the main exposure was the immigrant status, so recent immigrants versus long-term residents, um, and the secondary exposures were immigration class, duration of residence, and region of origin. This time, our outcomes were looking at emergency department visits for self-harm, um, as well as suicide. And, and these visits for self-harm may have included um, suicidal and non-suicidal behavior, so for example, cutting uh, versus a, a true suicide attempt. So um, what we have here um, is um, the total number of uh, visits to the emergency department over our, our study period for by long-term residents was around 50,000 for self-harm and just over 2,000 for 
um, self-harm in recent immigrants. And then suicides, there were almost 2,000 completed suicides in long-term residents and around 110 in recent immigrants. But when we, um, you know, put in, put this in our statistical models to look at, to compare the rates um, after adjusting for things like their age and their neighborhood level income and their sex, we see that recent immigrants um, have a 40% lower risk of self-harm compared with long-term residents and recent immigrants have a 30% lower risk of suicide compared with long-term residents. This looks at the trends over time. So these dark lines represent the long-term residents. And as you can see here, um, these are the male long-term residents who have the highest rates of suicide, um, which are about three times the rates of, of this dotted line of female um, long-term residents, which is has been well described in the literature uh, previously. In immigrants, what we see is that males also have a higher rate of suicide, but it's um, uh, not three times the rate uh, as we see in the non-immigrant group. Um, these lines, when we actually um, do some statistical modeling, we're not seeing changes over time and, and, and the rates have been quite steady over time. Um, when we break it down by um, refugees and non-refugees, um, here when we look at the total the total rates, refugees have a higher rate of suicide. But when we actually model this statistically, um, these are not statistically uh, significantly different, and this may be related to um, the the low numbers of suicide, which is I guess a good thing. Um, but from a statistical modeling standpoint, we may be underpowered to detect differences. When we look at the suicide rates um, by region of origin, um, across all regions of origin, there are, we're not detecting differences except in immigrants from Latin America and the Caribbean who um, have uh, um, lower rates of suicide. When we look at trends in emergency department self-harm by immigrant status and sex, what we see is female long-term residents have higher rates um, compared with this straight line, uh, sorry, the solid line um, of male long-term residents. And again, this has been well described that females have higher rates of self-harm, but lower rates of suicide compared with males. And we see this uh, also reflected in the female um, versus male recent immigrant population. But these uh, rates are actually declining over time. So when you can see from 2002 to 2012, uh, these, these numbers are going down. When we look at the specific subgroups of immigrants, um, so non-refugees, refugees, and based on their duration of residence, what we see is that recent refugees who have been here for less than five years have 1.72 times the risk of self-harm compared with um, non-refugees who have been here for less than five years. So refugees are a higher risk group, which is not surprising. Um, when we look at the rates over time, we see that the rates of self-harm over time are declining across all the immigrant groups, so refugees and non-refugees, except in refugees who have been here for five to 10 years. So we're doing something right uh, with the refugees who have been here you know, for less than five years, but the ones who have been here for a little bit longer, we're not seeing the same declines in self-harm that we're seeing in other immigrant populations. When we look by region of origin, um, what we see is that self-harm rates are lowest in immigrants from East Asia um, and highest in immigrants from South Asia. Um, and so, and there's quite a bit of variability in rates of self-harm by region of origin. And, and this, the comparison group is to North American, European and Central Asian uh, immigrants here. So our main findings here now are that rates of suicide um, and emergency department visits for self-harm are lower in recent immigrants compared with long-term residents. And again, is this due to a healthy immigrant effect? It, it may very well be. Um, we also found that rates of suicide are stable over time, but rates of self-harm are declining over time. Um, and is this because we're potentially seeing improvements in informal care and help seeking? Um, is it because of changing patterns of migration that are, are being reflected um, in the data? So shifting a little bit, um, I've presented to you some work on, on health service utilization, as well as some more um, objective measures of, of self-harm and suicide. And now I wanna shift the attention to um, mental health service delivery and pathways to care. 
So as you all probably know, prevention and early detection are becoming increasingly important um, for mental health in children and youth and, and finding interventions and improving the quality of care um, is really important, especially given the rising rates that we're seeing across the board. Um, and so as part of uh, this, what we were trying to do is we, we published a paper in the fall on use of the emergency department as a first point of contact for mental health care by immigrant youth in Canada. Um, again, this uh, was done um, at ICES. What we based this on was a, a study we did two years ago on um, looking at the general population and, and the emergency department as a first point of contact for mental health problems in children and youth. And what we what we know is that emergency services can play a key role in managing mental health crises in, in children and, and youth. But half of those who present to the emergency department have never previously had uh, contact with the mental health care system. So they're not seeing their family doctors um, or they're not going to outpatient clinics to get mental health care and instead they're showing up in the emergency department. Um, and this idea of using the emergency department as a first point of contact with the mental health system can be used as a health system performance measure. So when the system isn't functioning well or when there are deficiencies in the system, um, we're going to see higher rates of emergency department first contact. For some kids, it may be the only access point if the system is not functioning properly. Um, you know, sometimes it may be appropriate, for example, a first episode psychosis, when a family has nowhere to go, they may show up in the emergency room or somebody is suicidal. Um, they may show up in the emergency room, which is probably appropriate. But in in individuals who perhaps have long-standing anxiety, where um, they are more in a crisis mode and and were not suboptimally managed in the community because they never sought care, um, you know, the emergency department may not be the best place for them to for, to access their care um, in the first place. And so this indicator reflects factors that contribute to how, when, where, and who receives mental health care. So. Um, again, emergency, the emergency department as a first point of contact for mental health may reflect lack of access to timely diagnosis and treatment. It may reflect stigma, so individuals are not going and getting health care um, because they're, they, um, there's a lot of stigma associated with it um, until they're in crisis and really need um, urgent help. It may reflect poor access to primary care. Um, it may reflect under-recognition of a, a disease before crisis or it may reflect cultural differences in expectations of the health system or the disease. So in some cultures, it may be that you don't see a physician for mental uh, health problems. Um, and it may be that you um, seek out community leaders or, or um, religious uh, leaders uh, to address some mental health concerns um, in different cultures. This, this indicator can be tracked over time um, and it allows us to help uh, better align mental health services with the specific population needs. Um, and for us, um, when we did this first study, we, we wanted to break it down by immigrant groups because we found that aggregating access uh, results by immigrant status overall, just saying immigrants versus non-immigrants, may miss important variation within this heterogeneous population. So the objectives of this third study were to determine whether immigration and immigration related factors are associated with using the emergency department as an entryway into mental health services in Ontario. And again, um, we're not getting very creative here in our design, but um, we used a number of linked health and administrative data sets um, looking at youth ages 10 to 24 living in Ontario who presented to the emergency department uh, with a mental health concern for the first time. And this is a little bit more recent data. So this was looking at 2010 to 2014. And again, we were able to link uh, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada's permanent resident database to um, our data. Um, the, the study population were youth ages 10 to 24 who were eligible for provincial health insurance with an unscheduled incident visit to an emergency department visit for a mental health condition or for deliberate self-harm. Um, our outcome measure we were looking at was emergency department visits without previous outpatient physician care for mental health. So again, these are individuals who show up in the emergency department uh, for the first time with a mental health concern. And then we look back to say, have they ever seen a, a, a physician uh, for mental health in the last couple of years? We grouped these, um, our main predictor was uh, immigrant status, so non-immigrants, non-refugee immigrants, and refugees. And again, duration of residence, uh, region of origin, and country of origin. And we looked at a number of covariates as well. 
For this population, in our four-year time period, there were almost 120,000 um, children and youth in Ontario who had an incident emergency department visit for mental health, a mental health concern. Um, so these are in, youth who never had uh, previously been to the emergency room or hospitalized for mental health. About 6% were non-refugee immigrants and 2% were uh, refugee immigrants. So this table is a little busy, but I'll walk you through it. And this just shows the characteristics of those youth who first presented to the emergency department visit. Um, so when we look here uh, in this first column, these are non-immigrants and about seven and a half percent their primary care provider is um, a, a general practitioner or a family physician who uses a fee-for-service model. So they're not enrolled in a in a care model that may have access to allied health, or this may be sort of a walk-in clinic type model. Non-refugee immigrants, um, this number is a little bit higher, so 11%, and refugee immigrants um, is even higher, so around 14%. And this is important um, because walk-in clinic models or fee-for-service models may not be the ideal setting when you're trying to provide wraparound care for individuals, in particular when it comes to mental health, because fee-for-service models typically don't have um, ready access to a social worker um, or other support services or pediatricians, for example. When we look at the reason for presenting to the emergency room for the first time, a large proportion of these are for, these visits are for anxiety. So 22% of the visits in uh, refugee immigrants were for anxiety, 20% in non-refugee immigrants, and 20% for um, non-immigrants. And then there was a large proportion who presented for substance-related disorders. Um, so between anxiety and substance-related disorders, that made up over half of the visits to the emergency room. And then at the bottom, you can see that um, a lot of these children and youth are presenting at night, so not during the daytime hours, often when psychiatric services are more available, um, but they're presenting at night, so from midnight to 8 a.m., um, and 43% of those are in refugee children and youth. So when we look at our main outcome and, and compare those who are first presenting to the emergency department having with a mental health concern who have never had outpatient care, 51% of non-immigrants have um, never had outpatient care for their mental health problem. Um, not in non-refugee immigrants, that number is higher at 57.6%. And in refugees, that's 61%. So six in 10 refugees who present to the emergency room um, in crisis have never been to an outpatient mental health care physician um, prior to showing up in the emergency room. And so that's a 10% absolute difference, which is pretty um, clinically important. When we break this down um, further by some of their socio-demographic characteristics, um, what you see here is that there are some differences in the age grouping. So the 14 to 17 year olds, which make up a large proportion of our youth, um, have a, in the non-immigrants have you know about half who are not showing up, who have not had previous outpatient care. But when you look to the right um, at refugee immigrants, we see that 68 percent of refugee youth between 14 and 17 years have never sought outpatient care for their mental health concern before showing up in the emergency room. So that's a really important high number and is a potential group that we can target um, for getting these kids access to care before showing up um, in crisis in the emergency room. You know, commonly social deprivation is um, considered a risk factor for access to care and and, um, and mental illness. But what we see here is across the board, um, you know, low income is associated with um, high rates of using the emergency department as a first point of contact for mental health concerns. And we're seeing that in both non-refugees and refugee immigrants, as well as non-immigrants. Um, when we look um, at the types of uh, uh, first contact visits. What we see here is that um, substance related disorders are responsible for, a uh, sorry, in children who show up with substance related disorders, most of those have not had outpatient care. Um, so 75% of refugees who show up with a substance related uh, disorder have not had outpatient care before, as well as anxiety. Um, so, you know, these are really kids that um, would probably be best served not in an emergency department, but getting outpatient care before showing up in crisis. So again, the most common reasons for first contact were substance-related and anxiety disorders, but the highest rates of first contact were substance-related disorders, self-harm, anxiety, and acute stress.
when we look um, at uh, the how long they've been in Canada, what we see is that the highest rates of first contact are in recent immigrants. So 65 or 64% and 65% of um, the non-refugee and refugee immigrants are showing up for the first time without outpatient care. When we look at some of the regional patterns, what we see is that um, there are high rates of first contact in those from Central America and the Caribbean, in Africa, and in South and East Asia. Um, and when and the lowest rates are in those, again, from Western Europe, Central Asia. And you have to wonder whether or not um, the health system navigation and, and um, cultural similarities between Western Europe and, and Canada um, make it so that these individuals understand how to navigate the healthcare system um, or using a healthcare system that's more familiar uh, to them because of the cultural congruency um, that they may experience. When we looked further at um, the country of origin for um, the immigrants who first show up, uh, what we have done here is across the X axis here um, are the number of individuals from a given country who have shown up in the emergency department for the first time with a mental health concern. On this Y axis, we're looking at the rate of first mental health contact in the emergency department visit. So as an example, um, immigrants from India, there are about 500 during our study period who showed up in the emergency department for the first time. And then when you move across to the Y axis, around 60% of those never had outpatient care. So what we're doing here is we're comparing um, all of these country specific rates to the rates of non-immigrant youth, which is right here at 51%. So what you can see is immigrants from Pakistan, India, Philippines, Jamaica, Colombia, Saudi Arabia, Guyana, Congo, and Nigeria all have sign statistically significant higher rates of first contact um, than uh, non-immigrant youth. Um, these are some of the high volume, and but these are some of the high rate um, population. So Immigrants from Nigeria and Congo, for example, um, you know, 72 or 73 percent of them are not having had prior outpatient care. So, again, these are immigrants that we could really look to target for early intervention as outpatients before they show up in the emergency room. This next slide shows a similar graph, but shows countries that are high volume that have rates that are not statistically di significantly different from the non-immigrant rates um, in Canada. So um, China, for example, which is a high volume country and has almost 500 children and youth who show up in the emergency de department uh, for mental health, their, their rates are similar to Canadian born. Um, similarly, the US, Iran, UK, Russia, some of the sort of Western, Central Asia, Western Europe um, countries were seeing similar rates to the Canadian born population. So what we've shown then is that rates of first contact for mental health in the emergency department for Ontario's youth were highest among refugees and recent immigrants with large and clinically important absolute differences between the groups. Um, there's a lot of variability by region and country of origin. Um, and so immigrants and refugees and newcomers may not have the same access to or use of outpatient mental health care as non-immigrants. So why is this happening? Um, I do not have the answer to this. I wish I did. Um, but as I've alluded to, it may be that there are cultural differences um, in health seeking behaviors uh, in different immigrant groups. And that may be that I think is reflective in some of the um, heterogeneity by region and country of origin that we are seeing. It may be that there are differences in familial and social support networks. So, um, for example, um, some individual groups of, or some country specific or region specific groups of immigrants may be seeking care from support networks that are already existing in um, Canada. Um, or they may be using faith based organizations um, or groups who are able to provide them with some outpatient um, uh, mental health support before they're showing up in, in crisis. Language proficiency may be a concern. So immigrants from uh, countries where there's a lot of English and French language proficiency may um, be doing okay, but those who do not speak English may not be if we're not having uh, language appropriate services available to these immigrants. It may be that there are referral biases by um, care providers. So, um, you know, 
if I'm seeing a patient who um, has abdominal pain from one culture, uh, they may actually, I may, uh, but their abdominal pain may actually be somatic and a manifestation of uh, anxiety. Um, I may not be picking up, uh, that up on that um, because because of cultural differences, and therefore I don't refer them uh, for mental health support because I'm not picking up on it. And and there are those referral biases that may be there. There may also be care-seeking behaviors that are different um, based on understanding of the healthcare system, based on um, uh, understanding of uh, where to go uh, to get care. Um, and then, of course, stigma may be playing a large role in all of this. Um, so certain populations, we may not um, have have been able to decrease stigma the way we have in, in other populations, um, and certainly is an area that we need to continue to work on. So when we think about some of the strengths of, of this sort of of this work is that these are large population based studies and many um, of the other studies or existing literature on mental health of immigrants often relies on self report or is survey based um, or involves larger or smaller um, groups of immigrants in very specific populations but we're able to look at the whole population of Ontario and look more broadly at what's going on. Um, we're able to look across a broad range of mental health disorders um, with almost per complete provincial coverage and, and able to have detailed immigration data. Um, and this is also generalizable to other regions. So for example, Australia or the UK who have similarly large um, populations of immigrant youth. Um, interestingly, when I submit any of this immigrant work to the US often, um, I get comments back from reviewers questioning, you know, well, what about all the Latino immigrants? And, and certainly Canada has a very different immigrant population compared with the US. So may, these results may be less applicable to the US, but certainly applicable to Australia and the UK. Again, as I mentioned in one of my first slides, um, one of the main limitations here is the absence of information on social supports and informal use of mental health services. And this is where having some of that qualitative data um, is, is really important to complement uh, this more quantitative data that we're looking at. We also have not measured clinical comorbidities to see what other um, health concerns might be going on with these individuals. And currently, we do not have data on temporary or non-status residents, which are also um, represent a large proportion of immigrants to Canada. And um, you know, in, going forward in the future, understanding their mental health service needs are also going to be important. So some of the key messages then are that rates of first contact in the emergency department uh, for youth from uh, mental health conditions in Ontario were highest among refugees and recent immigrants to Canada. This reflects poor access to timely mental health care that may be delivered in an outpatient setting. And immigrants face barriers to using mental health services uh, from a physician on an outpatient basis, but there's variability within immigrant groups. Um, a better understanding of the barriers and enabling factors that contribute to the use of the mental health services and access to care are needed. And this includes focusing efforts to reduce stigma, identify mental health problems early before crises, and in particular among refugee and newcomer youth and immigrants from Africa and Central America. So this uh, work could not have been done without the support of many of my colleagues at ICES and funding from the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Um, and of course, our uh, collaborations with Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, who have provided us um, access to link the data um, on all the immigration variables. And, and it's been really wonderful getting to um, take a deeper dive at understanding immigrants um, and their use of the mental health care system. So thank you very much. And I'd like to open this up to questions now. All right. Thank you very much. Great presentation and, and really a lot of information, a lot of graphs, especially at the beginning. So there, some of the questions I think that were asked may have been sort of touched on in some of those. So I'll, I'll ask them anyway, but just acknowledging that I think so, some of them, them were were commented on at various points in your presentation. But um, right at the end, you, you listed in your limitations uh, the issue of you know, qualitative research to, uh, to you know, to back up some of uh, your suggestions as to why. Um, so the, the person asked, you know, as you were saying that, the person asked the question, do you have any connection to some qualitative research to help answer those, some of those why questions? Is there anyone you can point to that's sort of starting some of that qualitative research or just uh, that you'd be able to highlight? Um, yeah, so um, that's a, that's 
Great and timely. I've uh, just submitted a grant with um, a qualitative researcher from uh, CAMH to look at um, Juveria uh, Zahir, who is a scientist at CAMH in Toronto, um, to look at some of the, do the qualitative piece on um, immigrants from Muslim majority countries to understand um, their health seeking behaviors when it comes to mental health for suicide and self harm. Um, so we've been working together to try and better understand this um, using doing some interview work. Um, so certainly that work is underway. Um, but uh, yeah, we have a long way to go. <laughs> and the the first question that came in quite early on was uh, right after your first mention of the difference, the potential differences related to culture and health seeking behavior that might vary between cultures. You know, again, people are people are asking sort of, is there any studies to suggest to, to, to support that? Because we, we hear it all the time and anecdotally it sort of makes sense. But just wondering if there's anything to back up that, you know, that that cultural difference for the, the rates of suicide or, or any of that stuff. So I don't know for the rates of suicide, but some of the other work done by some of my colleagues at ICES um, has looked at um, different ethnic groups who show who um, are hospitalized for mental illness, and this is really in an adult population. Um, but what they showed, um, and I'm maybe a little off with the data, but what they showed is that certain um, cultural groups, I think it's South Asian um, immigrants. Um, and versus Chinese immigrants, they have different severities of presentation when they're hospitalized. So um, in Ontario, um, if you're admitted to a mental health bed, um, there's more detailed immigration available in one of our data sets to, to look at the severity of your disease. Um, and I, be I believe it was Chinese um, adults had much more severe illness um, when they were actually admitted to hospital. And that suggests that there may be cultural differences in, in understanding, um, you know, when they need to get care. And so that when they care, show up to care, they're, they're actually quite sick and quite advanced in terms of, in their, in terms of their disease. And so um, I am familiar with that study a little bit, um, but uh, I don't think there's a, a ton of studies at a population level to um, demonstrate that those cultural differences may be at play, more just anecdotal. All right. Um, the next question came in just as you were going into some of your uh, charts on um, self-harm. Uh, so she's referring to a, a spike that you that they in one of the graphs related to mental health health services among long term resident immigrants. Uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to flip back to that slide or right, you know what I'm talking know. about. Um, Sorry. Um. Wait, self-harm or suicide? Sorry, did you say? Well, the question came in right before that. So, so she's talking about uh, what contributes, she says, what contributes to the spike we see in mental health services among long-term resident immigrants? And it came in just right about that time. So the spike in, so in service use or self-harm then? Yeah, she doesn't really specify. She says, so it was in the first study. Okay. Um, I mean, if I'm interpreting this correctly, what are we, what is contributing to these rising rates in the pink? Is that correct? I, I, I think. Yeah. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. The one. Okay. Okay. Um, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think um, we're all trying to understand that better because a number of groups um, in in Ontario and in Canada have really shown that we're seeing these rising rates in health service use across all um, sectors, so outpatient and acute care sectors. Um, I think uh, we there, there has been a huge reduction in stigma um, and awareness of mental health, and there's been a lot of campaigns and a lot of efforts um, very broadly to reduce stigma. So I think that is um, a, a big contributing factor. Some of the social scientists and psychologists that we work with talk about um, in youth, I mean, this screen time um, and, and spending a lot of time on our devices and less time um, interacting with individuals and that may be contributing to some of the high rates of anxiety because when we break it down um, by 
the disease type that, you know, for when we look at the rates over time, a lot of what is driving this is uh, emergency department visits and hospitalizations for anxiety. Um, and that's been some other work that we, we did in Ontario, looking at just the general population of youth. Um, and so whether or not how um, youth are interacting with each other socially and, and the resilience and the coping uh, mechanisms that they have given technology and lack of face-to-face -face conversations and social supports, that way may be a contributing factor. But it, really, this is all speculation. Um, I think if we had the answer, um, you know, we would we would act on it. But I think stigma and um, different dynamics in how we access social supports are are two major contributing factors. And do you know uh, if there's any difference? If, are there any particular age groups that are contributing to that spike? Uh, so, for example, she's suggesting college students that might be under more stress or experiencing more anxiety. Yeah. So we did look in our. Um, I'll refer everybody to the we published um, last or June 2017, we published the um, scorecard for um, mental health for Ontario for children and youth. Um, it's called the Massive Scorecard, M-H-A-S-E-F, and it breaks um, down health systems use for mental health uh, for youth across all ages and populations and various equity lenses and by disease cohorts. But what we did find is that um, two key findings were one is that the, the rise in rates was driven by anxiety um, as well as by those age 14 to 17. Um, so this middle adolescent group um, have, have really high rates of um, or increasing rates of mental health service use. Um, the next question is asking if you can elaborate a bit about referral bias by care providers as a reason why immigrants might not be accessing outpatient services at similar rates as non-immigrants. So, um, as pro health, uh, health, frontline healthcare providers, we may um, interpret. Um, one's expression of distress differently um, depending on their culture and if there's cultural congruency versus discordance. Um, for example, if if you are, I don't know, a Sri Lankan physician and you're having, you have a Sri Lankan patient and you may understand sort of some of the nuances in terms of culture, you may refer them appropriately. But if there is a lot of discordance between who the healthcare provider is um, and the patient population they serve, we may not be picking up on those subtleties to reflect mental illness and may not refer them. Um, there's some evidence out of the U.S. Um, that shows that, for example, Black um, youth are get access to mental health more th um, through youth justice rather than through primary care providers. And if you are um, white and um, middle to upper class, you um, or high income, you um, are more likely to be referred by your primary care provider. And so um, even if you have the same disease, because of referral biases and, and understanding of disease processes, um, you may not get referred by your primary care provider um, or, or you may not be diagnosed um, by your primary care provider appropriately. Okay. Uh, so we do just have one more question here. So if anyone does have any sort of last minute questions that you're frantically typing away, we'll, we'll, if, if I see them come in, we'll, we do have some time to answer them. But this is uh, the last one we have here. And I may need a clarification from the person asking this last question because so the question is, as an immigrant and with my, she says, with my interactions with other immigrants, uh, not recognizing mental illness is more of a problem than stigma. Just wondering your thoughts on that. And I'm not sure if she means not recognizing mental illness on behalf, on the, the side of the clinicians or family members or others not recognizing mental illness, therefore not seeking care. So I'm not sure which, which, which she, she's talking about. But. So, so, I mean, I think, I think that uh, I'm not sure if that was a question or a point, but but the but I think it's both. I think as care providers, um, when there are cultural differences, we may not recognize um, expressions of distress. So when I mean in my clinical practice, I see a lot of children and youth with somatic symptom and related disorders. And so if um, a kid comes in with chronic headaches um, from one culture, I may think of, I may do sort of a full medical workup, um, whereas another kid may come in with um, chronic headaches because of the distress of just having immigrated and and that may be their physical manif manifestation of sort of internal distress and I, if I'm not picking up on that um, as a healthcare provider that disease goes under recognized until until crisis or until they um, in, until it's too late or not, or not early enough um, similarly I think there are cultural differences and and 
immigrant differences in um, people's understanding of what constitutes what the what the healthcare system is used for. So I think I mentioned it earlier, but um, some may not go to a healthcare provider for mental illness, um, not recognizing that it is a body system. You know, just like you know, children have problems with their gut, problems with their um, immune system, problems with what, whatever the system, body system, heart, their heart or their kidneys. And, and with mental illness, it, it is a problem with their brain, but it's not because there are no objective um, external symptoms sometimes that may go under-recognized by a family and they may not go to seek a care by a, a physician um, for whatever their distress they're experiencing. And I think she did clarify it's family members not recognizing the, t- the time or the need to seek care. And I think that you answered it perfectly at, at, at your last point there. And that they don't probably realize that there's a system here or there are services here to address that. They don't see that as the same kind of thing, exactly as you said, that you would go for any other health system issue. Yeah. Um, I think that's uh, that was the, the question she was asking for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we did have a couple more questions come in. Um, uh, just uh, again, sort of looking at study, uh, if you are aware of studies that show a difference in stigma of use of mental health service uh, between immigrants and non-immigrants, or is this something that needs to be looked at more? I think you sort of have addressed that a bit. There is not a lot of studies out there, but if you wanted to make further comment on that. So, I, I mean, I think um, there are uh, uh, survey-based studies looking at select populations of immigrants um, that comment on how they how they felt when they um, accessed the healthcare system and and didn't feel necessarily comfortable accessing the healthcare system um, but uh, really to be able to measure whether or not stigma plays a role specifically in how in you know help seeking um, I haven't seen a ton of studies um, but in immigrants specifically, but uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to um, not only say, you know, do, is stigma a major contributing factor, but how can we reduce stigma in those specific populations, especially, you know, in some of the populations, like, um, I'm not sure if you remember, like the Nigerian or um, Congolese uh, populations, which have really high rates of first contact with the mental health system in the eMERGE, and are there specific um, ways to reduce stigma in those in those specific populations, I think that's going to be really important going forward um, because there is heterogeneity in in how stigma plays out, I think. All right. And this is the last question. And after we take this question, we'll just uh, we'll just go back to you uh, after you answer this to uh, just think of any any closing messages or key messages you'd like to leave the audience with before we uh, finish up. But uh, the last question is is asking, you know, if, if there you sort of mentioned that use that example of the, the Sri Lankan physician and the, the Sri Lankan patient. And there might be more of an understanding of uh, or a, an ability to identify, uh, you know, through the cultural lens, the, the need for mental health services. So if there's recognition there. So just the question is asking if there's any data about country of origin of the care providers in relation uh, to referrals. For example, does access to physicians with knowledge of the culture or from that culture to help? Like, is there any evidence to suggest that? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't seen any um, personally, but it, it, it's possible that it exists. I don't know all the literature, um, but uh, that would be really um, good to to be able to look at going forward. Um, but I, I don't. I'm not familiar specifically with that. One last comment come in that said uh, this person's met people who are new to the country who did not know that there were public health resources for their pregnant wives, for example. So certainly awareness of these resources that may not be available in the countries that they came from and recognizing that they even exist is, is always a challenge for any of these. But mm-hmm. All right. So with that, uh, what, anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Uh, any any new, you mentioned one new study coming up, Any any anything anything else new you'd like to mention or any resources you'd like to direct people to if they want more information? Just anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Before. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a few things. I think one, often immigrants in general are um, viewed as uh, facing a lot of social deprivation and at high risk for mental health problems. But I think when we think about our immigrant population in Canada, they're actually a really healthy population that have a lot of potential to contribute to to Canada Um, and um, we have to um, you know capitalize on that and and ensure they stay healthy when they are um, in Canada and we know that over time they often um, their health outcomes converge towards the Canadian born but if we can 
learn from what they're doing right <laughs> to, to maintain their health. Um, that's important going forward. But I think we have to really keep an eye on these emerging disparities in outpatient access to care um, as they're evolving, because they're certainly um, contributing uh, to poor mental health outcomes for, for immigrant youth. And so keeping an eye on the emerging disparities and how we can, you know, nip them in the bud and, and get people the care they need is going to be really important going forward as Canada continues to accept large volumes of immigrants. Right. And it, great way to end it. Uh, you know, thank you for a great presentation. I mean, there was a, lots of data and lots of sort of uh, ideas to, to prompt conversation, lots of discussion points to carry forward from this. Obviously, as we discussed, lots of lots more work to do to get some evidence to sort of support some of these ideas. But uh, you certainly gave us a great foundation of what the what the status is as far as how these services are being accessed. So uh, I think it was very useful presentation for the audience today. Thank you very much. All right. So for those of you who may be new to the uh, to our webinars, we do these webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we did have a few questions asking if we they can get access to the slides and or the recordings, etc. And we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on our knowledge exchange network at ken.childrenshealthcarecanada.ca. Uh, there's a webinar section and you can find all of our uh, previous webinars, the recordings, often the slides, uh, and other resources occasionally as well on those pages. So uh, do, uh, don't do hesitate to uh, take a look at the Knowledge Exchange Network. And everyone registered here will receive an email in the next couple of days when that uh, recording is available with a link that will take you to that page. All right, so after saying that we do these webinars every Wednesday, we actually don't have a webinar next Wednesday, May 1st, we do not have a webinar, but we'll be back on May 8th, uh, where we will be talking about redefining outcomes of very preterm birth. And and this is a, a project that is about including the parent's voice in research. Uh, this session is part of our series that we have been doing over the last couple of years in partnership with our friends at Childbright. Uh, this webinar will introduce you to the Parent's Voice Project and why it's important for parents to be partners in research. The Parent Epic Team, they're called, uh, created the Parent's Voice Project, which aims to engage parents to co-create definitions of important preterm outcomes. Uh, this project is an example of one of the many ways uh, that research can be done with fa with families and not just about families. And Parent Epic is part of Child Bright, the Child Bright Network, which is a network of researchers dedicated to developing innovative in interventions to improve long-term outcomes for children with brain-based developmental disabilities. And they're funded in part by uh, the CIHR uh, strategy for patient-oriented research. So uh, that's, uh, again, that's not next week. That's in two weeks uh, on May 8th. So uh, thanks again to Dr. Saunders for a great presentation. Thanks to all of you for coming today, and hopefully we'll see everyone back here in a couple of weeks. Bye, everyone.